Autobiography by Benvenuto Cellini. Part 2. Section 21. Chapters 104 through 110. Chapter 104. During my promenade through the market, I met Joan Battista Santini, and he and I were taken back to supper by the priest. As I have related above, we supped at the early hour of twenty, because I made it known that I meant to return to Trespiano. Accordingly, they made all ready. The wife of Sabietta, when bustling about in the company of one Cecino, Booty, their knave of all work. After the salads had been mixed, and we were preparing to sit down to table, that evil priest, with a certain nasty sort of grin, exclaimed, "'I must beg you to excuse me, for I cannot sup with you. The reason is that some business of importance has occurred, which I must transact for my brother Sibieta. In his absence I am obliged to act for him.' We all begged him to stay, but could not alter his determination. So he departed, and we began our supper. After we had eaten the salads on some common platters, and they were preparing to serve the boiled meat, each guest received a porringer for himself. Santini, who was seated opposite me at the table, exclaimed, "'Do you notice that the crockery they give you is different from the rest? Did you ever see anything handsomer?' I answered that I had not noticed it. He also prayed me to invite Sibieta's wife to sit down with us, for she and that Kichino booty kept running hither and thither in the most extraordinary fuss and hurry. At last I induced the woman to join us. When she began to remonstrate, You do not like my victuals since you eat so little, I answered by praising the supper over and over again, and saying that I had never eaten better or with heartier appetite. Finally I told her that I had eaten quite enough. I could not imagine why she urged me so persistently to eat. After supper was over and it was past the hour of twenty-one, I became anxious to return to Trespiano, in order that I might recommence my work next morning in the loggia. Accordingly I bade farewell to the company, and having thanked our hostess, took a my leave. I had not gone three miles before I felt as though my stomach was on fire, and suffered such pain that it seemed a thousand years till I arrived at Trespiano. However, it pleased God that I reached it after nightfall with great toil, and immediately proceeded to my farm, where I went to bed. During the night I got no sleep, and was constantly disturbed by motions of my bowels. When day broke, feeling an intense heat in the rectum, I looked eagerly to see what this might mean, and found the clothes covered with blood. Then in a moment I conceived that I had eaten something poisonous, and racked my brains to think what it could have possibly been. It came back to my memory how Sbieta's wife had set before me plates, and porringers and saucers different from the others, and how that evil priest, Sbieta's brother, after giving himself such pains to do me honour, had yet refused to sup with us. Furthermore, I remembered what the priest had said about Sibieta's doing, such a fine stroke of business, by the sale of his farm to an old man for life, who could not be expected to survive a year. Giovanni Sardella had reported these words to me. All things considered, I made my mind up that they must have administered a dose of sublimate in the sauce, which was very well made, and pleasant to the taste, inasmuch as sublimant produces all the symptoms I was suffering from. Now it is my custom to take but little sauce or seasoning with my meat, excepting salt, and yet I had eaten two moderate mouthfuls of that sauce, because it was so tasteful. On further thinking I recollected how often that wife of Sbieta had teased me in a hundred ways to partake more freely of the sauce. On these accounts I felt absolutely certain that they had given me sublimate in that very dish. CHAPTER 105 Albeda was suffering so severely, I forced myself to work upon my colossus in the loggia. But after a few days I succumbed to the malady and took to my bed. No sooner did the Duchess hear that I was ill, 
than she caused the execution of that unlucky marvel to be assigned to Bartolomeo Amannato. He sent word to me through Messer Living Street that I might now do what I liked with my model since he had won the marble. This Messer was one of the lovers of Bartolomeo Amannato's wife, and being the most favored on account of his gentle manners and discretion, Amannato made things easy for him. There would be much to say upon this topic, however. I do not care to imitate his master Bandinello, who always wandered from the subject in his talk. Suffice it to say that I told Amanato's messenger I had always imagined it would turn out thus, let the man strain himself to the utmost, in proof of gratitude to fortune, for so great a favour so then deservedly conferred on him by her. All this while I stayed with sorry cheer in bed, and was attended by that most excellent man and physician, Maestro Francesco do Montevarchi. Together with him, Maestro Raffaello de Pili undertook the surgical part of my case. For as much as the sublimate had, had so corroded the intestines that I was unable to retain my motions, when Maestro Francesco saw that the poison had exerted all its strength, being indeed insufficient in quantity to overcome my vigorous constitutions, he said one day, Benvenuto, return thanks to God, for you have won the battle. Have no anxiety, since I mean to cure you, in spite of the rogues who sought to work your ruin. Maestro Raffaello then put in, This will be one of the finest and most difficult cures which was ever heard of, for I can tell you, Benvenuto, that you swallowed a good mouthful of sublimate. Thereupon Maestro Francesco took him up and said, It may possibly have been some venomous caterpillar. I replied, I know for certain what sort of poison it was, and who gave it to me, upon which we all were silent. They attended me more than six full months, and I remained more than a whole year before I could enjoy my life and vigor. When the Duke came to Florence, he sought me at my house without giving me previous notice. CHAPTER 106 At this time the Duke went to make his triumphal entry into Siena, and Amanato had gone there some months earlier to construct the arches. A bastard of his, who stayed behind in the loggia, removed the cloth with which I kept my model of Neptune covered, until it should be finished. As soon as I knew this, I complained to Signor Don Francesco, the Duke's son, who was kindly disposed towards me, and told him how they had disclosed my still imperfect statue. Had it been finished, I should not have given the fact a thought. The prince replied with a threatening toss of his head. Benvenuto, do not mind your statue having been uncovered, because these men are only working against themselves. Yet, if you want me to have it covered up, I will do so at once." He added many other words in my honour before a crowd of gentlemen who were there. I then begged His Excellency to give me the necessary means for finishing it, saying that I meant to make a present of it together with the little model to His Highness. He replied that he gladly accepted both gifts, and that he would have all the conveniences I asked for put at my disposal. Thus then I fed upon this trifling mark of favour which, in fact, proved the salvation of my life. For having been overwhelmed by so many evils, and such great annoyances, all at one fell swoop, I felt my forces failing. But this little gleam of encouragement inspired me with some hope of living. CHAPTER 107 A year had now passed since I bought the farm of Della Fonte from Sbietta. In addition to their attempt upon my life, by poisoning, and their numerous robberies, I noticed that the property yielded less than half what had been promised. Now, in addition to the deeds of contract, I had a declaration written by Sbietta's own hand, in which he bound himself before witnesses, to pay me over the yearly income I have mentioned. Armed with these documents, I had recourse to the Lord's counsellors. At that time, Messer Alfonso Quistello was still alive, and Councillor of the Exchequer. 
he sat upon the board which included Averado Serristori and Federico de Ricci. I cannot remember the names of all of them, but I know that one of the Alessandri was a member. Suffice it to say, the councillors of that session were men of weight and worth. When I had explained my cause to the magistracy, they all with one voice ruled that Sbieta should give me back my money, except Rodrigo de Ricci, who was then employing the fellow himself. The others unanimously expressed sorrow to me that Federico de Ricci prevented them from dispatching the affair. Averardo Serristori and Alessandri, in particular, made a tremendous stir about it, but Federico managed to protect matters until the magistracy went out of office. Whereupon Serristori, meeting me one morning, after they had come out, upon the Piazza del Annunziata, cried aloud, without the least regard to consequences, Federico de Ricci has been so much stronger than all of us put together, that you have been massacred against our will. I do not intend to say more upon this topic, since it would be too offensive to the supreme authorities of state. Enough that I was cruelly wronged at the will of a rich citizen, only because he made use of that shepherd fellow. CHAPTER 108 the duke was staying at Livorno, where I went to visit him in order merely to obtain release from his service. Now that I felt my vigour returning, and saw that I was used for nothing, it pained me to lose time which ought to have been spent upon my art. I made my mind up, therefore, went to Livorno, and found my prince, who received me with exceeding graciousness. Now I stayed there several days, and went out riding daily with His Excellency. Consequently I had excellent opportunities for saying all I wanted, since it was the Duke's custom to ride four miles out of Livorno, along the sea-coast, to the point where he was erecting a little fort. Not caring to be troubled with a crowd of people, he liked me to converse with him. So then, on one of these occasions, having observed him, pay me some remarkable attentions. I entered into the affair of Sbietta, and spoke as follows. My lord, I should like to narrate to your most illustrious excellency a very singular incident, which will explain why I was prevented from finishing that clay model of Neptune on which I was working in the Logia. Your excellency must know that I bought a farm for my life from Sbietta, to cut the matter short, I related the whole story in detail, without contaminating truth with falsehood. Now when I came to the poison, I remarked, that if I had ever proved an acceptable servant in the sight of his most illustrious excellency, he ought not to punish Sbieta or those who administered the poison, but rather to confer upon them some great benefit, inasmuch as the poison was not enough to kill me, but had exactly sufficed to cleanse me of a mortal viscosity, from which I suffered in my stomach and intestines. The poison, quoth I, worked so well, that whereas before I took it, I had perhaps but three or four years to live. I verily believe now that it has helped me to more than twenty years by bettering my constitution. For this mercy I return, thanks to God, with greater heartiness than ever, and this proves that a proverb I have sometimes heard spoken is true, which runs as follows. God send us evil, that may work us good. The Duke listened to my story through more than two miles of travel, keeping his attention fixed, and only uttering, Oh, the villains! I said in conclusion that I felt obliged to them, and opened other and more cheerful subjects of conversation. I kept upon the lookout for a convenient day, and when I found him well disposed for what I wanted, I entreated his most illustrious excellency to dismiss me in a friendly spirit, so that I might not have to waste the few years in which I should be fit to do anything. As for the balance due upon my Perseus, he might give this to me when he judged it opportune. Such was the pith of my discourse but I expanded it with lengthy compliments, expressing my gratitude toward His Most Illustrious Excellency. 
To all this he made absolutely no answer, but rather seemed to have taken my communication ill. On the following day Messer Bartolomeo Concino, one of the Duke's secretaries, and among the chiefest, came to me, and said, with somewhat of a bullying air, The Duke bids me tell you, that if you want your dismissal, he will grant it. But if you choose work, he will give you plenty. God grant you may have the power to execute all the orders. I replied that I desired nothing more than work to do, and would rather take it from the Duke than from any man whatever in the world. Whether they were popes, emperors, or kings, I should prefer to serve his most illustrious excellency for a halfpenny than any of the rest of them for a ducat. He then remarked, If that is your mind, you and he have struck a bargain without the need of further speech. So then, go back to Florence and be unconcerned. Rely on the duke's goodwill towards you. Accordingly, I made my way again to Florence. Chapter 109 Immediately after my arrival, there came to visit me a certain Raffaleone Scecchia, whose trade was that of a cloth of gold weaver. He began thus. My Benvenuto, I should like to reconcile you with Pirmaria Spieta. I replied that nobody could settle the affairs between us, except the Lord's counsellors. In the present court Spieta would not have a Federico de Riches to support him, a man willing for the bribe of a couple of fatted kids, without respect of God or of his honour, to back so infamous a cause, and do so vile a wrong to sacred justice. When I had uttered these words, and many others to the like effect, Raffaello kept on, blandly urging, that it was far better to eat a thrush in peace, than to bring a fat capon to one's table, even though one were quite sure to get it, after a hot fight. He further reminded me that lawsuits had a certain way of dragging on, and that I could employ the time, far better, upon some masterpiece of art, which would bring me to not only greater honour, but greater profit to boot. I knew that he was speaking the mere truth, and began to lend ear to his arguments. Before long, therefore, we arranged the matter of this way. Svieta was to rent the farm, from me at seventy golden crowns in gold, the year during the whole term of my natural life. But when we came to the contract, which was drawn up by Sir Giovanni, son of Sir Matteo de Falgano, Sbieta objected that the terms we had agreed on would involve our paying the largest duties to the revenue. He was not going to break his word, therefore we had better draw the lease for five years, to be renewed on the expiry of the term. He undertook to abide by his promise to renew, without raising further litigation. That rascal the priest, his brother, entered into similar engagements, and so the lease was drawn for five years. CHAPTER 110 Though I want to enter upon other topics, and to leave all this rascality alone a while, I am forced to narrate what happened at the termination of this five years' contract. Instead of abiding by their promised word, these two rogues declared they meant to give me up my farm, and would not keep it any longer upon leaves. I not unnaturally complained, but they retorted by ostentatiously unfolding the deed, and I found myself without any defence against their chicanery. When it came to this, I told them that Duke and Prince of Florence would not suffer folk to be so infamously massacred in their cities. That menace worked so forcibly upon their minds that they once more dispatched Raffaello Scheggia, the same man who negotiated the former arrangement. I must add that they professed their unwillingness to pay the same rent of seventy crowns as during the five years past while I replied that I would not take a farthing less. So then Raffaello came to look me up, and spoke to this effect. My Benvenuto, you know that I am acting in your interest. Now these men have placed themselves entirely in my hands. And he showed me a writing to this effect signed by them. 
not being aware that he was their close relative, I thought he would be an excellent arbitrator, and therefore placed myself also absolutely in his hands. This man of delicate honour then came one evening about a half hour after sunset, in the month of August, and induced me with the strongest pressure to draw up the contract then and there. He did so, because he knew that if he waited till the morning, the deceit he wished to practice on me must have failed. Accordingly the deed was executed, to the effect that they were to pay me a rent of sixty-five crowns in two half-yearly installments during the term of my natural life. Notwithstanding I rebelled against it, and refused to sit down quietly under the injustice, all was to no purpose. Raffaello exhibited my signature, and every one took part against me. At the same time he went on on protesting that he acted altogether in my interest and as my supporter. Neither the notary nor any others who heard of the affair knew that he was a relative of those two rogues, so they told me I was in the wrong. Accordingly I was forced to yield with the best grace I could, and what I have now to do is to live as long as I can manage. Close after these events, that is to say, in the December of 1566, following, I made another blunder. I bought half of the firm, Del Poggio, from them, or rather from Sbietta, for two hundred crowns. It marches with my property of La Fonte. Our terms were that the estate should revert at the term of three years, and I gave them a lease of it. I did this for the best, but I should have to delay too long upon the topic, were I to enter into all the rascalities they practised on me. Therefore I refer my cause entirely to God, knowing that He has ever defended me from those who sought to do me mischief. End of section 21